Hello and welcome to Collateral Insights, a new JP Morgan Collateral Services podcast series, bringing to you the latest thought leadership, best practices and trends impacting the collateral financing ecosystem, including focus areas such as asset mobilization, collateral innovation, efficiency, in addition to other common themes impacting the regulatory and sustainable financing landscape. My name is Ricky Smith, product manager within the collateral services business at JP Morgan. And I'm both pleased and honoured to be joined by our Global Head of Product Management of Agency Securities Lending, Harpreet Baines, who will be speaking from the perspective of an agent lender. The topic of discussion will be on sustainable financing, also known as ESG, and we'll be focusing on topics within the agent lending space, such as transparency, sustainable fund labels, stewardship, EU regulation, and recent developments within the US under the Biden regime. Now, before diving into the discussion today, I would like to provide our listeners with a few updates with regards to collateral, whereby the growing focus on sustainable finance is leading funds to restrict their assets to those weighted with companies adhering to specific ESG criteria, which also therefore includes the collateral they receive. In addition to the traditional eligibility exclusions and concentration limit tests, within our tri-party programme, we've incorporated multiple ESG indices that clients can build schedules against to test the eligibility of the collateral that they receive, thus facilitating a lender's requirements to integrate the collateral process into their wider ESG policies and sustainability framework. We also continue to work with ISLA through our active participation at both the ESG and collateral management steering groups, focused on the direction of ESG data integration, including adoption of best practice, vendor utilization, and where possible standardization which is inclusive of indices. I'd now like to move on by welcoming Preet, and we'll jump into the first topic, which follows on from the JP Morgan Financing and Collateral Conference, where back in February we heard the common topics of the ESG and securities lending discussion, which tends to be focused on collateral and proxy voting. However, it does now appear that focus may be shifting more towards transparency and the debate into whether the activity of securities lending itself lacks a transparency. So without further ado, welcome, Breit, to the episode, and interesting to get your opening thoughts here. Firstly, um, thank you for the introduction, Ricky. You know, the ESG space is for sure one that continues to occupy a, a significant amount of headline space, and it can be difficult at times, right, to digest all the information that hits our desks on this topic almost every day. So hopefully this brief session will help draw out for our listeners some of the prominent threads and discussion points, at least with respect to securities lending and ESG at this point in time. So now, you know, turning back to your first question, transparency, it's an interesting one, right? And and a theme I think for sure needs to be unpacked more as it's been part of the debates, but in rather broad terms, whereas I think what may assist the discussion is more precision around the actual risk. You know, in my view, generalized statements that there isn't transparency are, are hard to support. In fact, you know, Isla recently commented on this topic and highlighted that there are a number of regulatory and legislative safeguards that exist today to support transparency, some of which actually came about, as we know, as part of the post-financial crisis reform and accumulatively have helped shine the light on securities financing more so than ever before, really taking it out of the shadow and in most part being a key success factor in driving up investor confidence, hence the unprecedented levels of increasing supply that we see today. By that, I mean, you know, what are those key examples of protections that I'm referring to? So firstly, the recent implementation of SFTR, which has introduced granular transparency on transactions, including all lifecycle events and collateral. You then have the DAC 6 transparency requirements that require market participants to report arrangements where the main benefit is or can be assumed to be a tax advantage. And then very important to the fact pattern is that mostly all securities are lent to prudentially regulated entities with the transaction operating within a framework subject to a wide set of rules such as MIFID, the market abuse regime, the Bank of England money market code, all of which are there to protect against the buildup of risk malpractice, market abuse, as well as empty voting, and should help give lenders some reasonable comfort that there are measures to protect against wrongdoing by actors in the value chain. And, you know, further to this debate, Ricky, you could also argue that the very act of securities lending is indeed a mechanism for increasing transparency across capital markets through the crucial role that, you know, lending plays with price discovery and supporting short selling, 
which is a market tool that can help tackle greenwashing and help identify other significant issues and misrepresentations, such as we saw in the case of Wirecard. Thanks. Now, that's interesting, Brian. I think if we can draw attention to a, to a recent industry paper where we actually we saw the mention of the idea of, of tracking, tracking through the chain you know, in a like GPS way. Do, do you have any sort of thoughts around this? I do. So, look, you know, one question we have seen raised is in relation to the identity of counterparts in back to back arrangements, not because it impacts necessarily the long term ESG performance of the investment, but on the basis that a lender may not want to support its own business that wasn't aligned with own sustainability standards or aims. Here, I think it's important to remember that as it stands today, a lender does have full right to restrict any counterparties that don't meet the ESG criteria. However, at the same time, you do have to remain mindful of the current legal structure. The transaction relies on transfer of title where legal ownership passes to the borrower and the lender thereafter has no legal association beyond the party to whom they've lent their securities. And therefore, admittedly, existing market infrastructure doesn't today identify for the lender who their borrower counterpart might have onward dealt with in the chain. But the question that this opens up in my mind, at least, is is this any different to regular cash market trading where once the sale is complete, assets will inevitably regularly exchange ownership in the secondary market and without any further look through afforded to the original seller? And so, you know, going back to your question, whilst I am open minded to thinking about future tracking solutions, I do think we have to remain mindful that it will have limited value unless it comes hand in hand with reform of the legal structure, which isn't a small undertaking, right? So hence why it's really important to ensure that we don't get disproportionate in our response to the perceived risk. And similarly, if there are concerns around the reasons why counterparties are borrowing securities, agent lenders can keep lenders informed about the demand drivers for specific stocks supported by in-depth market insights from data providers to better understand market footprint. And therefore, whilst it may not be possible for lenders to know who the end users of their on loan stocks are, this information offers a reasonable idea of activity around particular stocks and reasons behind individual borrows more than ever before, in turn allowing for that more informed decision making around recourse restrictions should a lender feel uncomfortable with any particular transaction. Absolutely, absolutely. If we could now maybe turn our attention to the topic of labels. Now, there has been some ambiguity around whether obtaining a European Sustainable Fund label, i.e. an ESG label, actually prevents participation in an agency securities lending program. Uh, Can you give a, a view with regards to this? Yes. So you're right. We are seeing that labels for sustainable finance are gaining popularity in Europe. To put into context, nearly 1,500 labelled funds holding just under 700 billion of assets under management at the end of 2020. And this isn't too much of a surprise, right, given the increasing investor sentiment for ESG products and labels can be an effective means to give investors reassurance that the products that they are buying have been independently validated against agreed market best practices and they can certainly help increase the profile of ESG funds. However, what we also began to hear from clients, which was a tad concerning, was that there appeared to be some ambiguity amongst a few around whether obtaining a label precludes active participation in securities lending. So to try and address, we undertook our own independent review of the criteria published by four of the most prevalent labels. Specifically, we looked at France, Belgium, Luxembourg, Germany. And in our view, we found that whilst the criteria varies across labels, all seem to have provided little specific guidance or explicit references to a fund's participation in lending. Albeit that said, recently, you know, in May this year, Ricky, we did see the Fabelfin agency update its standard with a specific SEC lending section. However, what we did know through our review, as you'd expect, is a reoccurring reference to principles, namely corporate engagement, transparency of information to investors, adoption of portfolio exclusions, which in our view can effectively coexist alongside participation in lending. In fact, you know, going back to that recent action by the Fabelfin to include a new dedicated section for securities lending, where it clarifies expectations on voting and oversight, you could argue it removes the ambiguity as to whether lending is permitted. And on the contrary, the emphasis in the text for lenders to explore sustainability considerations with their providers can be implied to be an acknowledgement that solutions are possible. My point being, if they wanted to add explicit restrictions, then they could have done so within this amendment. So I take 
take this as a positive. I know timing is short today, so I won't go through each of the principles, but we have prepared a short paper which summarizes the criteria, our thoughts, and would be very pleased to share that with interested clients and discuss in more detail the ways in which programs can be structured to prevent there to have to be a choice between registering for a label versus generating additional income for investors. And just before I finish on this one, actually, just one further point, Ricky, I should also reiterate that this specific dialogue has also been raised with ISLA, as we'd like the opportunity to also table directly with agencies and hopefully lobby for wider messaging that may help with removing any doubt around this subject. So more to come on this one. Thank you. And then then really switching through the gears, we know what's happening in the EU but how is the, the rest of the world faring? I suppose more, more specifically, for, uh, the, the US. So we're under the new Biden administration and the changes are front of the SEC. Will we now see renewed focus on ESG within the political agenda? And probably second part of that question is, if so, where can we expect that focus to be placed? Yeah, look, I think it's fair to say that, you know, the previous high degree of divergence within Europe, and the little that was happening in the US, particularly at the Fed reg level, has now turned a different direction for sure. We are seeing a paradigm shift with developments almost on a daily basis. Whilst Europe has to date been the epicenter of the ESG regulatory debate with SFDR and other regulations, the Biden administration represents a significant shift in viewpoints from the previous with respect to climate change, DEI matters, and specifically the current leadership of the SEC has moved quickly and decisively to demonstrate the agency's intention to focus on ESG investing and climate related issues. For example, you know, within weeks of her appointment, we saw Alison Lee create a new ESG focused position within the office of the acting chair, Satyam Khanna, the first senior policy advisor for climate and ESG to advise on ESG matters and advance related initiatives. And this trend is also reflecting itself in market data. For example, if you look at some of the numbers from Bloomberg, it indicates that the US has taken over Europe's long-held dominance in ESG ETF funds. And whilst Europe remains the largest ESG ETF listings, The largest share of ESG ETF investments are now directed into the US. You know, a trend likely to continue, Ricky, fueled by the US climate push, broadening of fund strategies and overall increasing investor awareness. And on that point, are there any notable observations from your perspective, which gives us a preview as to how the fund industry may be impacted or or specifically alter the way they think about securities lending? Yeah, look, if I... If I, if I look back over the years so far, I think there are certainly some interesting preludes that could shape the ways in which funds have to think and consider for ESG into the future. If I had to point to the ones that stood out for me, I'd say firstly, the focus on disclosures. On you know, on March the 4th, we saw Lee launch a new climate and ESG task force within the SEC's Division of Enforcement which we understood and initially focused on identifying material gaps or misstatements in climate risk disclosures under existing rules, whilst also analysing both disclosure and compliance issues relating to funds ESG strategies. Still in March, we then heard Lee call for changes to shareholder proxy voting disclosures and reiterated the need to ensure that retail investors have more insight into how their money is voted. Most notably from this speech, you know, we also heard us scrutinise that balancing act that index funds must perform in exercising their voting capabilities in support of ESG matters, which can add value for investors versus maximising returns through an active securities lending programme. Secondly, I would probably call out the emphasis on greenwashing. You know, specifically in April, we saw the SEC issue a risk alert on ESG investing. Now, when the SEC puts out a risk alert, it's in all our interest to pay attention to it. And in this alert, the SEC introduced its observations from recent exams, emphasised the importance of consistency between stated and actual practices, and specifically expressed their concerns with greenwashing. Essentially, firms need to do what they are saying they are doing. And in recent weeks, we have seen more come out from Gensler on how we can expect the agency to address this concern going forward. And then finally, the announcements from the Department of Labor. So just to remind our listeners, last year, the DOL put out some very controversial rules precluding ERISA plans from considering ESG factors when investing, impacting the ability of fund managers to promote sustainability through their investments. However, in March, the DOL announced that it wouldn't be enforcing this rule, that it would be revisited, 
but it was unclear really at the time what timeline to expect, albeit it was welcome news to providers of ESG products. Now, fast forward three months, and at the end of May, we saw the introduction of a bill, which, if enacted, the proposed law would effectively clarify that retirement plans may consider ESG factors in investment decisions in a prudent manner, consistent with other fiduciary obligations, i.e. the same legal standard applied to other non-ESG factors. Now, I think it's reasonable to assume that opposition to the bill is likely. However, what is clear at this point is that if it is passed, it would make ESG consideration much easier for ERISA plan fiduciaries and therefore promote ESG investing more generally. And, and look, just to finish this point, you know, the focus on ESG isn't entirely new. Some will remember these comments from last year where she pointed out that reg involvement is needed around standard and comparable disclosures. Overlay that now, like you said, with Biden administration's broader commitment to advancing climate change. The current SEC focus on ESG is not therefore surprising. But the actions so far do leave you wondering what outcomes the enhanced and focus will lead to. You know, will Gensler be fully lockstep with the ESG views of Lee or will he align somewhere between those views and some of the other commissioners who in fact indicate that more caution is needed? So I think it's one to watch closely for sure. And maybe we should, you know, revisit this question in six to 12 months time in a future session to see where this focus actually leads us. Yeah, definitely a wait and see there, I think, to what direction that takes. And pre maybe picking up on the earlier mention of SFDR, and which for those less familiar is an EU disclosure and transparency regulation that sets out a number of entity and product level disclosure requirements of in-scope firms as regards to both sustainable investments and sustainability risks. Now, in your opinion, is, is agency lending considered an in-scope product, i.e. is it sustainable in its own right? And then if so, what, what does this mean and, and how firms products need to adapt to adhere to those requirements? OK, so just to remind listeners, right, and, and you sort of touched on it, the aim of the new regulation SFDR is to provide transparency on sustainability within the financial markets in a standardised way in order to reduce greenwashing and facilitate that comparability, thus supporting increased sustainable investment. Now, if you're conducting portfolio management under MIFID definitions from an entity based in Europe, which can be the case for cash reinvestments, then current interpretations suggest that agent lenders could be within scope in relation to those portfolio management activities. For those in scope, you then have to consider how you would categorize for disclosure purposes, vanilla, light green, dark green, which, by the way, just filtering into only three boxes is a challenge in itself, right, with a growing view that maybe more differentiation is needed. But, Ricky, what's made it even more confusing is the scrutiny applied by some as to whether securities lending in its own right as a product, not just in relation to cash reinvestment, should be considered as promoting sustainable characteristics on the basis that its role in the promotion of market liquidity ultimately leads to better capital raising conditions, which is good for ESG-focused companies. And now, my view is that this is quite a broad application and more work needed to verify that correlation between liquidity and the long-term ESG performance of a security to really test this one out. But the other side of the coin is, is acknowledging that lending for certain plays an important role in supporting the capital market ecosystem, but it's not a sustainable product in its own right, as the act of lending is not making a direct contribution to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Now, unfortunately, this debate isn't helped by the fact that the meaning of promotion within the regulation generally remains unclear. And it's actually one of the points where further clarification has been sought. Therefore, you know, as of now, as Isla pointed out at the time of Go Live, the most sensible thing is to wait until further clarity from the regulation is made available. And actually saying that, Ricky, you know, I've heard that the European Commission response to those clarity questions was actually published earlier this week. So that's my bedtime reading sorted. But, you know, also probably worth highlighting before I finish at this stage that the um, EU Commission has announced in this last month, a delay to the implementation of the second phase, right, until July 22, allowing for additional technical guidance to be made available to those impacted. And how do you think this, this impacts the demand for ESG products and fund managers more broadly? So what I think we can say more confidently, right, as of now, is that the increased transparency of which products are ESG and which are not could indeed provide additional support right to the development of ESG investing and push more capital towards sustainable activities. There has been, in fact, still is, right, a high degree of opaqueness, which makes selection of sustainable funds quite difficult. 
but the new categorization and the requirement to now provide detailed sustainability risk information will inevitably lead to more informed investor decision making, allowing them to compare and differentiate between funds and increase their ability to assess on the true sustainability of products. In fact, going further, you could argue that the disclosures will potentially expose laggards highlight non-ESG products as archaic. Therefore, in order to remain competitive, the market may see these now being converted, leading to a potential surge in sustainable fund launches as asset managers look to reposition products triggered by that comply or explain that SFDR is introducing. Finally, I think it'd be fair to say that in the future, we will see other regulators in other regions also inevitably responding with the introduction of similar rules. In fact, this month alone, we expect the FCA to announce a set of principles for ESG and sustainability fund design and disclosures. And in parallel, many other existing regulations are also planned to be upgraded. For example, distribution rules under MIFID are expected to be amended to reflect some ESG components. What this means as an agent lender Well, you know, we're watching these trends closely as this combination of expected growth and heightened focus may trigger a rise in scrutiny from impacted clients as they assess how their ESG strategies are integrated across all of their investment activities, including their lending programs. You know, there's little doubt in my mind that SFDR is placing sustainability right at the center of the investment process. And, you know, as an industry, we've already seen signs of such scrutiny and much as, you know, has been said already about the ability for lending to coexist alongside clients' ESG objectives. However, the spotlight only gets stronger with SFDR, in my view, and it becomes ever more crucial that we move this conversation from the why to the how with respect to aligning programs to client-specific strategies. Very interesting there, Pri. Thank you. Given the discussion today, it's focused on the view of an agent lender. It does seem reasonable to address the topic of stewardship and how a beneficial owner is able to continue to deliver healthier returns to investors whilst balancing their responsibilities with regards to demonstrating active stewardship over their investments. This, I feel, would also be of interest to our tri-party client base. So, so Preet, can I, can I please get your thoughts on the, on the last subject for today, please? So I begin by saying, look, firstly, I do think there is a need to dispel some of the reservation that exists among some buy side community that securities lending undermines an asset manager's stewardship responsibility around exercising voting rights. And as a result, maybe viewing lending as a barrier to effective shareholder engagement. Before I delve into any of the detail, it's important to place into context and recognize that the you know, proportion of a company's market cap that is routinely on loan is only at negligible levels, right? If you took some data from 2020, it suggests that in 2019, you know, on average, less than 1% of the market cap of the FTSE 100 was on loan at any one time during the year. And therefore, too simplistic in the wider debate on lost votes to only point to stock on loan as the sole contributing factor. That said, as an agent lender, we fully acknowledge that clients will increasingly be looking to drive long-term sustainable value through proxy voting. Hence, you know, why once a lender has established a full engagement voting strategy, it should be discussed with the lending agent who should be able to calibrate the program to ensure that the lending client has relevant securities back in their custody accounts ahead of important company meetings should clients be wishing to vote, therefore negating that risk of lending becoming an impediment to responsible voting. This is largely what happens today, where active stewardship has become an important part of our markets and best practice already reflects essential elements of shareholder engagement. In fact, data shows that there is clearly a reduction in lending supply over proxy record date, proving that the recall process is in play today. But all of that said, Ricky, we also clearly recognise that there will be differing views on what to recall and when since sustainability objectives differ across asset owners. And thus, you know, we continue to invest in our programme with this being at the forefront of our minds. And could you potentially share a little bit more about around what that investment entails? Sure. So what is meant by this is that we are placing a great deal of focus on enhancing our program with a data led approach that will enable clients to exercise greater flexibility when setting their preferences, whether it's a blanket recall defined by market size of holdings or even determined by vote materiality. In fact, you know, building on this last point, we're also seeing that while some asset owners have 
data already feeding down from their enterprise that is driving their position on voting and lending. Others are still in nascent stages. Therefore, to support further, we can now provide vote materiality scoring for global assets sourced from a leading third party proxy specialist as an additional data point to facilitate the process. And then finally, for all lenders, we provide our what if scenario tool, which enables clients to model the lost revenue that could have been earned if the securities had stayed on loan. You know, it's a recent investment we've made as we get that it's a complex process and essentially a juggling act between trying to balance stewardship goals and fiduciary duty to generate revenue. Therefore, being able to model the potential revenue impacts can be an enabler for more informed decision making. Look, just to summarize, right, we have to remember that for some time now, data in it and insights from securities lending have become increasingly more integral to investment decision making, pushing the role of the agent lender more upstream. And the same is playing itself out with ESG, right, as more and more of these objectives become integrated into portfolio construction. And we're keeping this point clearly at the forefront of our data development strategy. So just going back to the top, you know, we're confident that we can partner with clients to help incorporate the ESG considerations, help strike the right balance. And then there are some, you know, strong industry case studies, both from a global asset owner and asset manager perspective to demonstrate this. And, you know, we would very welcome the opportunity to discuss these proxy options in more detail with our clients. And with that, we have come to the end of the session. I'd like to firstly thank Preet very much for joining me to discuss this pertinent focus area. We've touched upon a wide range of topics. And from the discussion, it's evident that the ESG principles are increasingly being integrated into the whole investment process and growing in importance globally. I'd like to invite both our tri-party borrowers and lenders to reach out to their respective sales and client service representatives should they wish to learn more around the aforementioned developments with regards to collateral solutions in the context of ESG. I hope all listeners have enjoyed today's discussion and we very much look forward to bringing to you the second episode in the near term. This communication is provided for information purposes only. It is not intended as an offer or solicitation for the purchase, sale or tender of any financial instrument. Please visit jpmorgan.com for more information, including important disclosures. 2021, JP Morgan Chase & Co. All rights reserved. This episode was recorded on July 27th, 2021.